They connect the computers again. <laughs> Might have to pull up the wit show. Do I have to run up there? The, uh, if you go to view, show MIDI, window, you gotta just go to the, the lyrics by itself. Just go to the lyrics, Nate. I'll run up during the greeting. Just turn the lyrics by itself for now. stand together. Now your mercy has saved my soul. Now your freedom is all that I know. The only new Jesus when I make Okay, how about that? I mean, if you were expecting everything to work perfect all the time, it doesn't. The devil is always trying to mess up stuff. If you're visiting with us today, you have on your bulletin here a little tear off. You can fill that out. You can also put a prayer request on that. Inside the pew is yellow cards for the prayer team. If you have something heavy on your heart you'd like for us to pray for, I'm a little froggy today from the pollen and everything else going on, but we're going to be good today. All right. If you are visiting, we want to welcome you. So I'm going to ask our members to go around and greet those that are here today.
It's like a Farida. <laughs> Piano. Let's pray. Lord, we come here today uh, just so thankful, Lord, that we get this opportunity to come back in your house and meet with you this morning, Lord. Um, so thankful for the week that we've had. Uh, thankful for each person in this room, Lord, and each family that's represented. I just pray as we continue to worship, Lord, that you open our hearts, that we're receptive to your message, Lord. Put your hand on Brother Jimmy as he prepares it. Pray all this in your holy name. Amen.
Things that come at us that we weren't expecting, things that we were expecting that are still difficult, but God is still on his throne, amen? Amen. He's still king. He's still Lord of our lives, amen? Amen. Yeah. 
Just one of those days, folks, you, you know, when you deal with technology that's supposed to improve everything. So I'm going to have to do one of those charismatic sermons because I'm holding a mic like they do <laughs> instead of the old Baptist thing. Uh, today, what I want to talk to you about is the rapture. And the title of this message today is, Are You Ready? Next week, we're going to talk about the Antichrist. But I hope that after uh, looking at this passage, we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And I hope after this message today that you are excited if you know Jesus Christ. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, you're going to be scared to death at the end of this message. You're going to need to make a decision about where you want to spend eternity because it all depends on the decision you make on this side of the world when you're down here. And so today, as we look at this passage, we're also going to look at 1 Corinthians 15, because that's another one. Very important. I wish I could duct tape this to my chest right here, you know, because this is just weird holding this thing. But the next greatest event to take place is the rapture of the church. And we are seeing the signs right before us that God is getting ready to come back. And you need to be excited about those signs that you're seeing and not be fearful. We're not to be fearful of these times because he's told us, I'm keeping you from the hour of testing. One of the greatest verses is Revelation 3.10. He says, because you've been faithful, I'm going to keep you from the hour of testing that he's going to pour out onto this world. And he is letting all these horrible things take place in our world right now to wake us up and wake the others up and say, get ready because I'm coming soon. 
You know, as you can smell the rain coming before it comes, you can smell the signs of his return, of what the world's going to look like. So we need to be excited about that. Now, that word rapture in the book is the Greek word we get harpazo. And what that word means, it's a catching away, it's a snatching away, it's a very quick event that takes place. There's not going to be a remind message that comes to you on your phone that says, the rapture's happening, you need to get ready and get outside. It's not going to happen that way. You're not going to be on Facebook and all of a sudden somebody go, hey, rapture's today. It's not going to be an internet. You're not going to get an email or anything like that. When it says that word means harpazo, it means a quick, in the blink of an eye, it's going to take place. There's no time to get ready. And Jesus says, I'm going to come back in an hour when you won't expect it. It may not be on a Sunday morning. And it's going to be a great event that takes place, but you need to be ready for it. Because you don't want to be on a plane and the pilot and you not Christians. Because guess what happens when that pilot gets raptured, the plane's going down, and everybody that was not a Christian on that plane is going to have chaos. Think about it. People driving down the road, all of a sudden, and, and I said there's like 8 billion people in the world. I would put a safe number that 1 billion people are Christians. And you take those 1 billion people and you remove them in an instant. Say an 18 wheeler's driving down the road. And the 18 wheelers, as it's going down the road, all of a sudden the driver disappears. That truck's out of control. All the different things that could take place. Think about people that are sitting in their homes, all of a sudden their babies are gone. They're out of there. They've been raptured because they are saved as an infant, but the parents weren't. All of a sudden they're wondering where their kids are. It's, it's going to be a very chaotic, very scary event if you don't know Jesus. But if you do, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. So let us pray, and then we'll read this scripture uh, this morning, and we'll get going, okay? Father, thank you so much for everything that you do. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the warning that you give us. Thank you for the birth signs that we're seeing take place in our world today. And I just ask, God, that if uh, there's anyone in this room who is not ready to meet you in that event, that you would get them ready today. It's in your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. Is that other one? Just let me plug the pack in. Is this, there we go. Praise Jesus. Thank you. And y'all, this happens. We don't blame anybody working it. They're doing the best they can up there. It's, you have stuff that fails from time to time. So um, I used to deep snap punts for our football team. And nobody knew who I was until the one went over the punter's head. You know, that's the only time that they would recognize who I was out there. And that's what happens sometimes when you work in the, the AV room. And I'm grateful for all those people up there doing the things behind the scene. Uh, David's son is up there. Tracy, I can't remember who else is in that room with them. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Nate, for all this. But there's a lot of verses in our Bible that speak about Jesus' return, the Lord's return. And what that is, that is when he comes back at the end of the tribulation period. There's a lot of verses that talk about that. There's only three verses that talk about the rapture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 18, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 57, and Revelation 4, verses 1 and 2. What we're going to do is we're going to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we've just got a couple of verses we're going to read. I think it's 16 and 17 that we're going to read. I'm going to let you sit today, okay? You guys have been standing a little bit, so we're just going to read these verses this morning. It says, for the Lord himself, and if you remember that last song, the hymn we sang, it talked about the shout. We're going to hear a shout pretty soon. It says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we always be with the Lord. Amen. Good news is coming. He's told us what's going to take place. 
So I told you also there's another verse in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. It says, after these things, I look, this is John saying, and he says, behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like the sound of a trumpet speaking to me and said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was standing in heaven and the one sitting on the throne. Don't just read over those words. John's saying, this is what it's going to look like. When you get up to heaven, you're going to see the Father. You're going to see the Son sitting on that throne. It's going to be the most beautiful thing that you've ever seen. There's a common theme throughout the Bible, and that theme is mentioning a trumpet. It's always taking place. And we're told in clear language that the rapture will initiate. It will kick off with the sound of that trumpet. And I believe that we won't hear the very end of that trumpet blast before we're out of here. We'll just hear the very first, and we won't hear the rest. We're gone. That quick. That quick. Paul says in the twinkling of an eye, blink. Everybody blink. That's how quick. If not faster, you're gone. I can't wait for that moment. I hope we're that generation that's, that gets to do that, okay? But it will kick off with the sound of a trumpet. And the writers of the New Testament knew well about the trumpet. They were very familiar with that. So when Jesus is is talking about this, and when Paul's talking about it, they're very acquainted with what trumpet means, okay? And the modern Bible students, people like us, we need to get educated on what the trumpet means and what it meant for them and what it means for us in in, uh, our modern times. In the biblical times, there was four specific purposes for a trumpet being blown. Number one is to proclaim victory. Okay, a trumpet was blown to proclaim victory. The second reason was to call an assembly. To assemble the people together, a trumpet was blown. The third was to announce a warning. Look out, the enemies are coming. They would blow the trumpet to let them know. The fourth reason a trumpet was blown was to call troops to battle. Can't you see the parallel, the symbolism in that in the, as, as it lines up with the rapture? All four of these events that I talked about will take place. The first is to proclaim victory. The trumpet's going to be blown. And what that means is there's victory over this world. Jesus will have that trumpet blown, and it says, the world is mine. Finally, he's taken the title deed back, and it's his. And it will announce to the church, it's time to come home. My bride, it's time to come home. The second thing that the trumpet will do for us as a church is believers will be called to assemble themselves together. It's not going to be one group going, Baptists aren't going to go first, then Methodists or whatever. It's the one for us to Jesus Christ. Boom. We're all gone. Can you picture that scene in the sky? Looking around at all the people. And you saw what the passage said. It said that the dead in Christ shall rise first. What that means, a lot of people get confused about that. If you have a loved one, I have loved ones, friends that are in heaven right now. Their body is in the ground right now or wherever they put it or wherever. I had a friend that was in a helicopter crash. His body's at the bottom of the sea, but he was a Christian. But his soul in him is up in heaven. And it says when that trumpet blasts, what happens is God's going to resurrect those bodies wherever they are, and they're going up to meet the spirits that are already in heaven, and they're going to be on the clouds up there. And it says, then those who are alive, hopefully that's us, those who are alive on earth are going next. So the ones in heaven are coming down with him on the clouds to meet. All our our friends, our pastor, our loved ones, they're in some kind of spiritual body right now, and then he's going to resurrect their body out of the ground and give them their new body, put it up there in the clouds, and they're going to wait for us. And then you and me, if it's our generation, we're going up. And then he's going to take us to heaven, and then this tribulation will start, the seven-year period. It's broken into two, three-and-a-half-year periods. The first is called the tribulation because it's the time of peace. And we'll talk more next week about the Antichrist, how he's going to usher that in. And then when you hit that second mark, the great tribulation, that's when all hell breaks loose literally on earth. And it's a scary time, and you do not want to be left behind. You can become a Christian during the tribulation, but it's going to be very hard. If you don't have guts to walk down that aisle 15 steps and pray to receive Christ, you're not going to do it when they say we're going to cut your head off if you're going to do it in those days. 
It's a lot easier to come down here and fill out a card and talk to me than it is to be facing the Antichrist and his demons during that time. So you want to make sure that you're getting right. So the third thing I said is the trumpets will announce the warning of the judgment to the world. So it's a victory trumpet. It calls believers to assemble together. It announces the warning to the world that you're in trouble. You waited too long. The church is being rolled up like a scroll. And then the third, fourth thing that the trumpet does for the tribulation, it calls the angelic troops to get ready for battle. It's unleashing Satan at that time. The Antichrist will use, uh, the Satan will use the Antichrist at that time. And the Roman army used trumpets all the time to carry out movement of troops. Um, first, they would, tell the, they would blow the trumpet and tell them to pull up their tents and prepare to move on. Second, they would blow the trumpet to alert them to fall in line. And the last trumpet would be a signal to move out. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, he tells us that we are leaving at the last trumpet. I want to read this passage to you. It says, listen, I'm telling you a mystery. Remember, Paul got to go to heaven. He says, I'm telling you a mystery. He says, we will not all fall asleep, but we will all be changed in a moment in the blink of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed. For this corruptible must be clothed with incorruptibility, and this mortal must be clothed with immortality. When this corruptible is clothed with incor incorruptibility, and this mortal is clothed with immortality, then the saying that is written will take place. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Death is done when that trumpet blows for us Christians. It's over, okay? It's over. At the rapture, that trumpet's going to blow, and it's a call for all those that are saved by grace through Jesus Christ. Remember, you can't save yourself. It's by what he's done. And when that trumpet blows, it's your reward. It's the beginning of eternity for us. And he says that your body will be changed. And many of y'all love your bodies. You wouldn't do anything to change them, would you? I told you, <laughs> some want to be taller, some want to be thinner, some want to be uh, hairier, some want to, you know, look a little younger and all that, you get a new body, and you're going to love it. You're going to love it. And the best thing about it is all the things that we struggle with in our flesh are gone. They get left behind at that trumpet. So the first thing that we see is our Lord will have returned. He promised this in John 14, 1 through 3. He says, if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again to receive you, that where I am, there you can be also. And he's telling us, I've got a place prepared for you, and I'm going to come back. He says, at very first verse of John 14, he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. And I'm telling you that same thing today. You ought to be smiling, thinking about, come on, God. Let's do this. I'm on the winning side. I know how this thing ends because I've read your book. And you, we win, and we get out of here. But... Until that moment, we need to understand we need to be busy sharing. And that's why I, I preach messages like this, because I want anyone that's not prepared to be prepared. And if you walk out of this room rejecting the call that God's giving you to come to him as Lord and Savior, and you get to heaven because you're going to face him, and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, and you say, I didn't ever hear about that, he's going to replay this right now. He's going to say, this was one of many where you were warned. You know, have you ever, you know, people struggle with um, why would God allow somebody to go to hell? God pursues people, but he's, you have free will to reject him. Ever, I'll just use me as an example. Have you ever pursued a girl, guys, and she didn't want anything to do with you. You sent her flowers. You tried to go on dates. Hey, let's, you know, you kept inviting her to do stuff. And she kept rejecting you. You couldn't force her to love you, right? You couldn't. God's that same way. He's sending flowers. He's sending love out to the world to people. But he's not going to force that relationship. And he says, if you don't want anything, because I had a girl tell me that one time. She goes, I don't want anything to do with you. Stay away from me. 
If you keep rejecting God's love calls to you, and you say, I don't want anything to do with you, stay away from me, he will make that come true for eternity. You will be separated in a place called hell for eternity because you rejected his love. That's sad. That's sad for what he's done for you. Now, we have people in our lives that we love very dearly and that are very special to us, but you don't know the love he has for you deeply yet until you get to experience that personally in your life. You know, at his ascension, he told the angels were there, showed up as he's going up on the clouds, and the disciples are watching this. The disciples got to see so many cool things. Um, you know, the miracles that he did, uh, the, the, just the words he spoke were so incredible to him. So in Acts chapter 1, the disciples are there, and Jesus is, has given his last speech, and he's ascending up on the clouds. And I don't know, I've seen these guys on the water that have the little thing hooked up to them where they're kind of hovering up uh, on the water, and, and he's, he's rising up, and they're just watching him. And some of them, I'm sure, were brought to tears going, Lord's gone. He's leaving us. And it says this, and after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. These are angels. They also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come just in the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. So you want to know what the rapture looks like? They just told you, these two angels. They said, just as he left up on a cloud, he's coming back. And all of us are going to see him. Now, there's talk about aliens growing more and more now. Have you heard about that? They, they've got aliens, and they're talking more and more. I believe that's one of the tools that he's going to use to say, aliens got rid of all these idiot Christians for us. We're going to have a better world now. They'll have some excuse to, to talk about the, how we disappeared and come up for it. But he promised us that he would come back for us. What's the purpose of the rapture? to receive his bride that he redeemed and purchased. That's the, perp that's the purpose. He says, I'm going to come back for you. I promised you I would. Then we're going to see the resurrected, it talks about. It says, we'll not all fall asleep, but we'll be changed in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we will be changed. Some of your versions say, have fallen asleep. And it's not talking about the soul falling asleep. There's no, some people believe that when you die, you just fall asleep until he wakes you up, or that's it. No, your body goes to sleep. You're out of there. 2 Corinthians 5, 8, my, one of my favorite verses says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Say it again with me. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. That means in the twinkling of an eye, if it, you don't, if we don't get to see the rapture and the Lord decides to take you home before you nod your head, you're in heaven. You're in heaven. I've seen some beautiful things in my life. Um, my grandmother was dying and hospice was in there and my, my dad was in the, the room with her. And um, they had the, the blackout curtains and everything going on, and she hasn't moved in a while. Uh, she um, didn't even get up, you know, rise up out of bed. She was unconscious for a while. And then at one night, um, my dad and, and the nurse are sitting in there. The room lights up. She sits up in bed. She hadn't moved in months. And she starts talking to people in the room, to her husband, to her sister, to her brother. Dad's looking around, seeing if a car light may have come in, you know, and, and the hospice nurse says, we see things like this all the time. And she'd had a first husband that passed away, and she'd remarried and had a second husband. And my dad goes, Mama, what are you, what are you looking at? She goes, well... There's Olin and there's Truman. She goes, I don't know which one to go with. 
And she goes, and there's my sis. And he goes, you're seeing them? He goes, yeah, they said it's time. They've come to get me. He says, well, go with daddy. And she says, these angels are here. They said, I'm going with them. She laid back down, took a deep breath, and she was gone. What a sweet picture that is. Whether we go in the rapture, or as Christians, we can, we can have faith knowing and secure, be secure knowing that he's going to come get us and he's going to take us home. Hang in there. I know things get frustrating sometimes. I know life is hard. I know you miss people that are on the other side right now. But let me tell you, they're okay. And if they could come back right now, they would say, let me tell you about heaven. Woo! You won't believe it. Even the flowers sing his praises. You wouldn't believe who's over there. You wouldn't believe what he's built. And I saw your place. Beautiful. Wait till you see Jesus. He can't wait to see you. He loves you so much. And he's ready for you to come home in a little bit. You know, that word asleep pictures a mom rocking a baby. And Paul struggled with the ideal of heaven, just like if you really think about it, you would too. And Philippians 1.23 says, I'm hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and to be with Christ, for that is very much the better thing. Don't you feel like that some days? Lord, when are you going to come back? Let that horn blast and let's go. And then there's other days you think about, man, there's so many people who don't know Jesus. You need to be busy. That's our call for today. Number one, get ready. Are you ready? Do you know Jesus Christ? as your Lord and Savior. On that timeline in your life, is there a moment, an event that took place when you asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior? Okay? It's got to be there. If that's not, you need to take care of that. Because before I could finish today, we could be out of here. You could skip lunch and be in heaven. That's okay with me too. I eat all the time. I can skip a meal to go to heaven. Could happen tonight. Could happen tomorrow. Could happen in 100 years from now. I don't know. I'm not giving a date. I'm just telling you is when we look at the things in the world, and he tells us these are the signs, these are the birth pains of when I'm getting ready to come, church. Get ready. They're happening in record speed. Do you know the Temple Institute in Israel the, the has decided to already start cutting the stones for the third temple? You know when that third temple comes? After we're gone. They've already got the priest, the Levite priest trained. They've already got all the garments. They've already got all the utensils ready. They've been rehearsing how to do the sacrifices. They feel it inside of their bones as the Jewish people that God, the Messiah is about to return. And if they're getting excited about it and they're God's people, the apple of his eye, we need to be paying attention to what's taking place and seeing that these armies that are coming together like Iran and Russia are the ones talked about, Magog and the battle at uh, uh, Armageddon. When that battle takes place, these armies are already preparing for that to go after Israel, that little piece of Israel they want. Something's going to happen on that Temple Mount to that shrine that the Muslims have there, the Golden Dome. Something's going to happen. An earthquake, something's going to swallow up, and they're going to put their third temple up. They said they can have it up in at least six months and start going. They're ready. Are you? If you do know Jesus Christ, you ought to be smiling from ear to ear when you hear words like this because your redemption draws near. We're going home soon, folks. We're going home. And all this stuff. So whatever you're battling these days, let it go. It's not that big a deal. You got something better on the horizon. I hope you're encouraged by this today. Let's all stand.
Father, thank you for your word that tells us we're coming home and that you're coming to get us. Whether it's by a natural death, we have that security of knowing where our eternity is, those of us that have trusted you, or whether it's you return and you take your whole bride home at once. Lord, I am praying for that moment. I'm praying for those that don't know you that they would wake up, repent, and turn to you. And I'm praying for us as a church, Lord, that we'd be sharing with everybody that we can. We're not responsible for the results. We just need to tell people, you are coming back soon. This world's getting more and more evil. You're not going to put up with that. You're going to call your church. So if there's anyone in here today, Lord, that doesn't know you, don't let them get left behind. Draw them to you. It's in your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from.